Well, welcome everybody to this episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. And um, you have clicked uh, play, you have clicked download, you have clicked um, um, subscribe on a podcast that deals with um, what the title says, Crucible Experiences. And it deals with them in the context of your leadership. Um, crucible experiences are those things that can be failures, that can be um, tra traumatic, tragic, difficult circumstances in your life. It's those pain points that we all experience. Um, and we talk about them in the context of this show to not wallow in them, not to live in the past, but to, to, to bring the past forward to the, to the present and the future and to um, help us come away with hope for overcoming those crucibles, strategies for overcoming those crucibles, moving past those crucibles, and then ultimately to charting a course to a life of significance. Um, I am joined as always by the founder of Crucible Leadership and the host of Beyond the Crucible, Warwick Fairfax. Uh, Warwick, it's uh, great to be back together again. Absolutely, Gary. Looking forward to it. Um, I talked at the outset about how we uh, talk about crucible experiences in order to not live in the past, but to bring the past into the present and then bring uh, the past through the future. And the subject that we're going to talk about today is really one that is focused on how we live today in the present and how that affects the future. We're going to talk today about legacy. And um, it's something that comes up an awful lot in Warwick's writings, uh, an awful lot in um, just the conversations he has as he talks about what Crucible Leadership's about. So Warwick, I'm going to kind of sit back and let you uh, let the listeners know a little bit about what legacy is and isn't and, um, and how we go about uh, building a good one. Thanks, Gary. Uh, legacy is sort of a bit of a loaded word. Um, you know, for me, uh, like for a lot of people, you think of legacy, how do you want to be remembered by? Uh, for me growing up, as I think a lot of listeners would know in a large family media business in Australia, uh, legacy was an intimidating word, uh, sort of a concept that brought almost fear uh, because uh, you know, the, the company was founded by my great-great-grandfather, John Fairfax. He had come out from England in the late 1830s. And he founded this huge media company that, by the time I was growing up, had newspapers, TV stations, radio stations, magazines. It was uh, an enormous company with thousands of employees. So the, the legacy was, was huge. So um, I grew up in an environment where my parents were hoping that I could continue the legacy of the founder. Uh, they would say to me, you could be one of the great Fairfaxes, which to me translated to having a legacy that would impact Australia, where I grew up, the nation, the landscape, somehow make it a better place. Uh, my name would sort of live on for, I don't know, long time, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, so that, when I, if you'd asked me then what's a legacy, it would be uh, carrying on the ideals of the founder and making a name that would, you know, somehow make its mark in history. I mean, that's a, a mammoth benchmark and what made it worse in a sense as I'm reflecting on it is, you know, my dad loved history. He was a big Anglophile, loved everything in terms of English history. So, you know, we would read about, talk about some of the great heroes, whether it's um, uh, the Duke of Wellington, the Battle of Waterloo and the Napoleonic Wars, or Admiral Horatio Nelson before the Battle of Trafalgar, sending a signal to the fleet saying, you know, England expects every man to do his duty. I mean, sort of stirring stuff. That was kind of the model. Later on, I loved American history. So whether it's Lincoln, Washington, you know, all these great leaders in history, it is like, well, that's what it is to leave a legacy, I suppose, in my naivety and youth. So um, 
yeah, it almost felt like leaving a legacy. What's your chances of that? Like one in a million? I mean, I have a different view now, but legacy felt like so intimidating. It's like, well, why bother? I mean, who, who could leave a legacy like Churchill, Lincoln, Nelson, even my great, great grandfather. It's like, you just give up. You know? And it's, um, here's the good news to all of our listeners. You do not have to be Churchill. You do not have to be <laughs> Washington. You do not have to be Admiral Horatio Nelson. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, the, the aspect of legacy that we're going to talk about is, is, is not that grand, is not that historic making necessarily. Nothing wrong if it is, but the legacy that, that we're going to talk about is a bit more personal in the sense that um, it affects a smaller group of people um, and it, it reflects on the way that you lived your life. One of the things that you didn't mention, Warwick, that is part of the story of your great-great-grandfather's legacy, there was indeed, uh, he, was, he was a big name and Fairfax Media was a huge, um, a, a huge operation in Australia. But there was also, and we think about this a lot when we think of legacy, sometimes we go there first. Legacy is about money. Legacy is about what you leave materially to the generation that follows. And I know in your own case, that was true with, the, with part of the legacy that John Fairfax left. Yes, no, it's, it's a good point that certainly he came out from England in the late 1830s with pretty much nothing and built this huge media business. And yes, over succeeding generations, it, it, it led to his kids, grandkids, great grandkids having a far better lifestyle, uh, certainly wealth, money, power. Yes, all that was there. But um, there's a really a, a greater legacy, which was sort of helpful to me because as listeners will know, you know, when I launched the $2.25 billion takeover in uh, 87, and several years later, the company went under under my stewardship. If I was just focused on the family business legacy, that would be a little devastating because kind of I ended it. But yet I would say there was a greater legacy um, and it was more his character. He um, was a wonderful dad, a uh, wonderful husband. His kids loved him, wife loved him. His employees uh, loved him. When he, uh, when he died, um, his employees felt they'd lost a very... Uh, valued uh, friend, somebody that they really, uh, you know, admired. So um, really the way he treated people, his character, he was a person of great faith and elder of his church. There was a legacy in terms of faith and character that was passed down on my family through the generations. Um, so while over time the faith became a bit more traditional, there was always this legacy of service of uh, our family members never try to manipulate news to uh, push any particular um, agenda. Right. The goal was always to try to have it independent and fair, and it's not always a challenge, and you know, fair right. can be in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> right. Uh, but certainly there wasn't a sense of uh, trying to manipulate things. Uh, and then we have a sense of just service to the community. So the values and character and certainly uh, for me the model of his faith uh, that was something that um, that was a legacy that was carried down to the generations and ultimately now that's more what i think of not so much oh you know what a great wasn't a great he founded this newspaper business and that was good right that was a good legacy i won't shortchange it at all but there was a greater legacy and the greater legacy was more uh, a combination of his character, faith, values, how he treated people. You know, it's, uh, we'll get to this more later, but, um, you know, uh, think of a scripture, you know, what should a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? And I think, you know, so what if you build this big empire, but your family and friends just think you're a jerk? Right. What's the point? I'm, I remember many years ago, listening to a radio station about somebody who founded one of the biggest uh, nonprofits in the world and helps people in pretty much every uh, uh, country, uh, especially that are 
you know, where poverty is an issue. Uh, and I remember his daughter was on this radio program and she was so bitter because he mm. had this notion, which he was, a, a, I say, unfortunately a person of faith because he said, I, I've done this deal with God that, you know, he'll look after my family while I go off and do all these wonderful nonprofit things, which totally distorts, I think, a true faith position. And, and she was angry. She was bitter because she didn't really see much of her daddy who's running around saving the world. I remember thinking, I was in my 20s, I remember listening to that saying, I don't want to be that person. And right. okay, how much good I do, I do not want to abandon my you know, wife and kids. That's not going to be me. So that's, okay, he founded this great organization, but at what cost? Is that really the legacy you want to live? I, I mean, I, I don't want to be that guy. Right. And that's another bit of good news for you, listener, is you do not have to leave $2.25 billion companies behind mm -hmm. for the next generations. But those things that Warwick was talking about that we're going to get into now, we've talked a little bit about what isn't the legacy that necessarily crucible leadership is, is, is urging people is, is trying to help people um, establish. We've talked about what it, 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 it may not be, but let's unpack Warwick uh, what it might be. And you recently wrote about this in a, in a blog. And one of the things that struck me about one of the things that you wrote was um, that we have to be intentional about our legacy and to think about it uh, in terms of what do you want your epitaph to be? What do you want people to say about you after you're gone? How do you want to um, uh, encourage people? How do you want them to look back in the way that you look back on John Fairfax? How do you want them, future generations in your own family, and perhaps if you have a, a somewhat larger footprint um, in society or in your spheres of influence, how do you want people to look at you? So unpack for listeners a little bit about what are, are a few of the things that we can all be thinking about when we're thinking about establishing a lasting legacy. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with work because that's often what we think of legacy and it's so far beyond that. But I don't want to say it's wrong to be successful, nor do I want to say it's wrong to make a mark, but it's more, as I've come to realize, it's less the size of the organization that you might be involved in or your position in it. It's from a work perspective, it's more, are you doing work that you feel is, is meaningful, that is contributing to society in some way that you feel like is uh, helping lead a life of significance, helping, you know, uh, help others. So yes, that is part of it. Um, but the size, size doesn't matter, but it's, it's more than just work. We often think our legacy is just about what we do. You know, we're gonna do some wonderful thing, but it's more about, or as much about, you know, how do you wanna be remembered? Whether it's your tombstone or somebody's giving a eulogy at your funeral. Do you wanna just be, hey, you know, uh, Fred or Mary made millions or billions? Is that it? It just, it just seems so empty. Typically when we're on our deathbed, we're not thinking that way. We're thinking, well, what does my wife or husband think? What do my kids think? What are my friends? What are my coworkers? That's often the legacy that's more important. That really gets more into character. Mm -hmm. How do our beliefs and values translate into how we, how we treat those that, that love us? You know, values and beliefs are sort of the, um, uh, the cornerstone, the our careers, everything we do needs to be in line with that. And to me, if we have a family, and this is certainly my position, if you're going to have a family, you can't neglect it. You can't just abandon your wife, husband, or kids and somehow feel like, oh, I'm serving some greater cause. Some people may think that's okay. I think that's just wrong. That's just, I mean, if you're going to have a family, uh, care for them. I mean, I think in my own family, um, you know, I love my dad uh, very much. I was born when he was in his uh, late fifties. He was married three times. My mother was married twice. And I think especially the kids from his first marriage, he was in his twenties, thirties, forties. He was in, very involved in the newspaper, was in there all hours, you know, working very hard. Uh, he was wealthy and so people in the 30s who were wealthy they might take a trip to england or europe for a year 
Well, he left his kids at home. Okay, there was a nanny looking after them. It sounds now like it's almost like child abuse, but believe it or not, it was not uncommon in that in society in those days. Well, it's like, I, I loved him very much, but I, I would never just leave my kids, you know, they were very small for a year, you know? Right. Uh, one, I was a little bit off tra uh, uh, topic, but, you know, he was raised by nannies. Uh, I had a nanny when I was small. It's like, you know, we, I grew up, it, well, my kids grew up comfortably, but there's no way we would have a nanny raise our kids. You know, you know, we took our kids to soccer or recitals. That to me is important. And, you know, one of the things as I reflect in my own, you know, obviously and nobody's perfect, but what's interesting to me is one of the things we do in birthdays is, um, you know, we say what we admire about whoever the person's birthday is and that we have some writers in the family and so we write cards <laughs> and all and over the years what's staggering to me and my kids are all in their 20s now uh, my boys who played soccer my daughter did color guard which is sort of like uh, people wave the flags with marching band and concerts and stuff they all basically said that i really appreciated the fact that you did at my game my soccer games uh um, you know marching band color guard concerts you were there and I'm just, I, I, I'm not perfect. I'm sure there are a lot of things I've done wrong, but I'm glad they didn't say, dad, you know what? You were never there at my game. Right. But never there. So that's something that I'm just so grateful. But it's staggering how every single card they ever write, they always say that. Yep. Year after year after year. So all that's to say is, I know I'm harping on this a bit, but I believe in it strong. If you're going to have a family, be present because that's the legacy ultimately, maybe the most important legacy that your kids, your grandkids, you want to be admired and respected. You don't want to say, yep, guy or woman was really successful, but I hardly ever knew them. They were never there. You know, it's just, you just don't want to be that person when it comes to legacy, family, you know, family first, so to speak, friends, coworkers, that's a legacy that you can influence no matter how, prominent or not prominent you are you might live in a big city a small town that's a legacy we can all influence and and trust me you know not I, not many of us are there are listening to this and hopefully there isn't anybody on their deathbed listening to this podcast but right. you know for most of us we're not there today you know you don't want to be on your deathbed saying i blew it because there's no second chances and what would you be thinking you'll be thinking about those that you love spouse kids friends, that's the legacy that ultimately will matter to you. So if it matters to you on your deathbed, want to get a head start and start worrying about it now and start doing something. Right. It's interesting that you bring that up about um, on your deathbed and how you want to be remembered um, on your tombstone. You and I have talked about this many times, um, but uh, I did a little research. Um, and if you go back and you look at the uh, arguably the three most successful, um, well-known musical stars of the last hundred years. Those would be Elvis Presley for rock and roll, Johnny Cash for country, Frank Sinatra for jazz standards. Um, all of them have passed. And um, uh, I didn't tell you this uh, as we were prepping for this podcast, but it, I did some research. Of those three, they had 42 number one singles in their careers. That is, a, that is Herculean success when it comes to their chosen careers in music. How many, listener, we'll ask you this question uh, rhetorically because you can't answer to us, but how many of those number one records do you think are mentioned on their tombstone? Warwick, you want to answer that question? I have a feeling it's none. Yeah, you're right. It's zero. <laughs> um, here's what, just very briefly, here's what is on the, the tombstones of those three individuals I spoke of. Frank Sinatra's tombstone s simply says, beloved husband and father. Johnny Cash's tombstone simply contains the text or, or one of the verses from Psalm 19, Psalm 1914 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This man with 13 number one hits, that's what he chose to be remembered for on his tombstone. Elvis Presley, there is some mention down uh, uh, sort of a very long um, uh, uh, tombstone. There is some mention of the fact that he changed music and he did some things like that, but no specifics about gold records, big hits, none of that stuff. And it says simply at the top in the biggest letters, Elvis Aaron Presley, son of Vernon Elvis Presley, and Gladys Love Presley, and father of Lisa Marie Presley. Here you have these people who have every reason to boast in their accomplishments, to every reason to focus on their legacy being what they accomplished. And instead, they focused on the things that you were just talking about, their family and their faith. And that to me says a lot. So think of these three, Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash. They're on their deathbed. You think they're thinking, boy, I'm so glad for those 41 hits or the, you know, the amazing songs. I think they were grateful. I think they enjoyed it. But that wouldn't have been their last thoughts. I can't imagine to be thinking of their, of their kids, their spouse. So I don't want to say don't pursue your dreams, but you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, being the next Walt Disney or, you know, George Lucas or Steven Spielberg, people that have made, um, you know, founded a huge, uh, in this case, movie uh, empires and brought a lot of joy and happiness uh, to people through their work. There's nothing wrong with that. But as you do, but you don't have to be at that level. It could be a small business in a small town, or you could be a factory worker for some local plant for 50 years. It doesn't really matter that much in the whole sum scheme of things. It's more how do those who you know you'll leave behind how will how will they remember you your family your friends your spouse how do you want to be remembered ultimately that's what was important to these three to johnny cash elvis presley and frank sinatra yeah so i think we can learn from them again i i keep saying this i don't want people to say okay so it doesn't to just stick your head in the sand and do nothing no meaningful work where you're leading a life significance to help others that's fine but the size of your accomplishment doesn't matter because for most of us, we're not going to be met, remembered by history. 99% of us won't be remembered now, still less in 10, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. You know, uh, it's, it's kind of meaningless in the whole sum scheme of history. Um, can any of us remember, you know, who were some of the great figures in, I don't know, 300 AD or something? Right. Like, no, you know? I mean, maybe there's a couple of historians, but most of us know, most of us don't care. Okay, so there's just how you treat others, um, how you're remembered by those that love you. As Gary said, what do you want on your tombstone? And just picture this. Uh, imagine somebody is giving you a eulogy. Now imagine you could give them some notes. You know, mm. not, it's not suggesting you kind of write your eulogy before you die and hand it to, to your descendants to read, but just think about what would you like them to say about you? And then do an assessment of your own life and say, okay, how far off am I from what I would like that eulogy to look like? And if you feel like there's a gap, and for some of us there might be a big gap, but what can we do now? And that may mean choices. Right. If you're like a traveling salesman and you're sort of gone 52 weeks a year, or maybe you need to find another way to help support your family so that you're going to be around a bit more. You know, it's life's about choices, but make choices in your life that are in line with your values and beliefs and your legacy and in line with how the eulogy that you want to be given, not the one that may be given, but the one that you want to be given. The, the, the time is now to make those uh, life-defining, legacy-defining choices. Don't wait on your deathbed and say, you know, I blew it. Right. N n now's the time to change the course of your life, assuming it needs changing, to leave a legacy that you want to leave, a legacy that 
uh, your family, friends, coworkers will admire. That's something that every single listener here can make a, a significant difference in that is, com that is in your control to change. A lot right. of things in life you can't control. Mm -hmm. Your legacy, I don't know about control it, but you can significantly influence your legacy. Everybody can do that. Right. I want to circle back uh, to your great, great grandfather, John Fairfax, because yes, there's a, there's an ending point. There's a natural point to talk about legacy on the deathbed on um, your tombstone. But there's also what we, you know, talk about a living legacy and Warwick, I would submit, and, and I'd like to hear your comments on this for the listeners, but John Fairfax's um, legacy is still living today beyond his tombstone, beyond his eulogy. Uh, it's still living today in you and in your children. Fair? It is. And it's interesting. There's one other quote that I want to read um, because I think it has a different meaning than I think I maybe originally thought. So John Fairfax was a man of great faith, went to the Pitt Street Congregational Church in Sydney, which is still standing. It's in downtown Sydney. And the pastor at his funeral, he chose as his text, 2 Samuel 3.38. And in the King James, which is kind of what they used back then, <laughs> says this, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And he might say, okay, fine. So he was kind of like a king and did really well. He did well. But when I look at that, it's more, um, why was, did they consider him a prince and a great man? I would say it was far more about his character, about how he treated people, how his fellow how his employees looked at him, how his wife and kids looked at him. That to me is what made him a great man. And so it's you know, that model of, of faith and how people should be treated. It, it certainly influenced generations of my family. And for me, when, um, you know, I came to, in my own faith journey, came to faith in Christ, it was really, even back then in my 20s, it was more about who he was as a person and how he treated people. There's a, a biography of him written in the 1940s, a sort of a loving portrait. And the, the person that paints him to be is just awe-inspiring in terms of character. Mm. So that was a model for me. And in my own way, tried to you know, live it to um, hopefully pass down to my kids that sort of legacy of both faith, family, how you treat people with respect. Um, also a sense of, of humility which to me, uh, I'm sure he had. Humility is a hugely important value, especially when you come from such wealth as I did. So that sense of just not thinking that you're better than other people and just respect others. So there was a legacy of character that's been passed down from him through generations that, uh, that my wife and I, I think, are trying to pass on to our kids. So that's, that's a legacy that's lasted. I'm the fifth generation. That's a legacy that's lasted five right. generations. Six, if you obviously, yeah. you know, uh, weave your, your yeah. children into it, yeah. So you might say, how in the world could I leave a legacy that lasts five or six generations? A legacy of character can last that long. Mm. A, a, a family business, well, ours lasted five. A few businesses last, you know, that long. Right. So that, that's, you know, no matter how good a job you've done, it's not gonna last. But character, in some sense, can be eternal. Character, the values, that can be passed on from generation to generation. That's, that's a much, from an economic perspective, that's a better investment. You know? yeah, right. Character, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to last a lot longer. So, um, yeah, it's had a huge impact. One of the things I keep thinking about as we talk about this, and we're going to get to the point where we've got to land the plane <laughs> soon. Uh, the the, the, the uh, landing gear is down. Um, but I want to hit this point because you, we talk a lot at Crucible Leadership. You, Warwick, uh, are the author of this, uh, of this sentiment as it applies to Crucible Leadership. You talk a lot about living a life of significance. And Crucible Leadership is about ways in which you can recover from crucible moments, learn the lessons, discover how you're designed and how you've been refined, what your vision is. Um, so that you can point yourself toward a life of significance. But it strikes me 
that what we're talking about here in legacy, if the, if the end result of crucible leadership on earth is to have lived a life of significance, is it fair to say that where we should aim our legacy is to be a legacy of significance? Is that fair? It is. Because when we talk about a life of significance, it's a life lived on purpose, in some sense, a higher purpose, as however you define it, that's devoted to helping others. And so a legacy of significance, uh, you know, it's, it's one where you're remembered as somebody that's focused on other people. You're kind, you're humble. You want the best for your spouse and your kids and your friends. You're a giving, selfless person. So whether it's at work or at home, that sense of significance of life, not devoted to your own ego or own aggrandizement of riches, power, and money, but more a life dedicated to the service of others, that kind of life of significance will leave a lasting legacy, a legacy of significance. So you, if, you, if you live a life of significance, you have a much greater chance of having a legacy that you'll be proud of and a legacy that will last. Mm. Well, as the, um, as the co-pilot of this plane that we're about to land, I'm going to take the, um, the liberty of addressing the passengers on the plane uh, as we close up. Uh, I found uh, on Inc. Magazine, uh, for, for those of you listeners who are saying, okay, this all sounds great, how do I do it? What are some things I can do? Work talked about, you know, your family needs to be a priority, but here are five practical tips that Inc. Magazine, which is a business magazine, offered for leaders that are also applicable to all of us every day. But here's five things that you can do to leave a meaningful legacy, just very quickly. One, prioritize people over results. Two, invest your time and money. And they put time first. Invest your time in people. Invest your time in things that you care about. Um, three, I love this one. Connect in person. In this day and age, we spend so much time connecting electronically. We're grateful that we have the opportunity to, co to connect electronically with you, listener. But in your lives, connect in person. Work talked about it, about your family, about your friends. Connect in person. Make time for that. Another thing that Inc. suggested was to... Um, Model behavior that you want to last. Do the things in your life that you want to be remembered for. Do the things in your life that you want people to follow. Uh, create disciples in that sense. Be a mentor to someone in that sense. Um, those are just five very practical takeaway steps as you're looking at this idea of legacy. You're looking to lead a life of significance out of your crucible moment. How then do you make sure that in, in addition to doing that, you're also leaving a legacy of significance? Those are just four things that one publication, Inc. Magazine, suggests. You know, what's interesting to me about that is some people might say, okay, so you're saying I can't pursue success and I got to care about coworkers, friends, and family. Well, if you listen carefully to those points at Inc. Magazine, the reality is if you treat your employees and your coworkers well, they're more likely to work harder to stay. You'll attract the best and the brightest. Who wants to work for somebody that, you know, cheats, steals, or, you know, takes all the adulation for them, browbeats them, treats them badly. Those who have a choice leave. And so, you know, the best and the brightest, they're the first ones to go. It says, you know, forget this. So treating people well with care and respect actually makes good business sense. So the bottom line is by caring for your family, treating them well, loving, respecting them, respecting coworkers, leaving a legacy that you'd be proud of, that you will be remembered by, you might just find, you know, maybe you won't have some multi-million dollar business, but whatever, whatever you're doing, it will probably have done better than if you had lived a life differently. So the, the bottom line is, you know, commercial success and treating people well and leaving a legacy that you'd be proud of. Those two things, rather than being against each other, I think at least in some sense, one can support the other. It's not mm -hmm. either or. Right. So I think what that Inc. magazine says is really very telling. 
Well, a wise co-pilot knows when to let the pilot have the last word when it's a good last word. So we're going to sign off now and we're going to thank you listeners for joining us on Beyond the Crucible. If you found this discussion insightful and helpful as you pursue not only a life of significance, but hopefully a legacy of significance, we have a favor to ask that will help us help more people just like you who are seeking a way to move beyond their crucible experiences. Here's the idea, very simple, here's the favor. Please subscribe to Beyond the Crucible on the app that you're listening to right now. It will allow you to make sure you don't miss an episode and it will make it easier for others to find us, listen to us, and share the podcast with their friends and coworkers. And if you've heard anything today that you'd like to learn more about, we encourage you to visit us on the web at crucibleleadership.com. Um, and one of the things that you can do there as you begin to walk out, as you continue to walk out this path toward a life of significance, a legacy of significance, one of the things you'll find there is a free, short, assessment that will allow you to see where you are, give you insight to where you are on this road from crucible experience on one end to life of significance, legacy of significance on the other. Visit crucibleleadership.com and you'll be able to take this assessment for no cost and um, really jumpstart your quest for a life of significance. So until the next time that we're together, do remember that crucible experiences can be painful. Uh, they, they can feel like your entire world has collapsed in upon you. But the good news is, as Warwick uh, has proven himself and as crucible leadership uh, talks about, those crucible experiences aren't the end of your story. Those crucible experiences can actually be the beginning of a new chapter in your story that leads to something uh, phenomenal, a life of significance and a legacy of significance.